we're at the um, Peabody Public Library, and we are interviewing Tim Davis. And in the room are myself, Janet Skank, the director of the library, and Christine Will, who is uh, manning the camera. Um, I know you gave me some of this information for the form, but I do need you, just for the film, to uh, state your branch of the service. Marine Corps. Um, in what war and what rank? I was uh, in the Vietnam War, and I was a Corporal E-4. Mr. Davis, um, were you drafted or did you enlist in the I enlisted. Okay. And where were you living when you enlisted? I was living in Sydney, Indiana, population 210. And why did you enlist? Uh, well, I enlisted because uh, I have a family background in military. Service. I had a brother that was in Korea, and I had two brothers in Vietnam at the time that I enlisted. Why did so, you pick the Marines? Uh, to be different. I went in with a <laughs> Marine Corps recruiter came to the high school, and so did the Army and the Navy and Air Force. And uh, myself and five others that went in together thought he was the best dressed, and we went with that one. Okay. Um, do you recall what it was like when you first went in? Yes. Can you explain that a little bit? Uh, scared to death. Got on the plane in uh, Fort Wayne and uh, flew out to San Diego where we were greeted by the meanest people I ever seen in my life. And they were Marine Corps. They were in the Marine Corps and they were picking us up at the airport. And they were just absolutely mean. Okay, I have, I, I've had relatives in the Marine too, but they say they're always Marine. Uh, this was boot camp, I assume, that you're talking this about. This was boot camp, yes. Um, you think that, were they affecting that or was just that the way they were? That's just the way they, okay. they were to get the best out of us right off the bat. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about boot camp? Uh, well, basically how you survived it. What I remembered most was uh, the yellow footprints. We got off the bus, we had to go line up on these footprints. We, they timed it so we arrived about two o'clock in the morning and of which we had to get our hair cut and uh, it's the first time I had to do like 50 push-ups at one time because I laughed at the kid in front of me that Tony Mishler he had real long blonde hair and I looked at him and saw the light glaring off of his head and I laughed and of course then when my buddy Ray Helton come in behind me he started laughing at mine and he had to do push-ups so. Um, you went as a, did you go as a group then, a whole bunch of you signed up? There, were, there was about five of us that went together. And they sent you all the And when members. we signed up, they promised us uh, that we would all stay together, but after boot camp, we never saw anybody until after we got out, mm -hmm. which is typical. And, and what year is this now? 1967. 67. Okay. Okay. Um. But all in all, I love boot camp. After I got halfway through, and my brothers always told me to be quiet and only speak when you're spoken to, and everything will work, and and it did. And I was one of only 10% get to come out of PFC, get your first stripe, which would have been only seven of us, and I was one of those. Congratulations. Um, you talked about you were in the Vietnam War. Um, did you go directly to Vietnam after the camp? I went to boot camp August 1st, 1967, and left for Vietnam in January, right after, during the Tet Offensive, which is the, the Vietnamese uh, New Year celebration. Do you remember what it was like when you first arrived in Vietnam? Yes. Uh, we arrived, got off the plane, and the first thing we saw were these uh, bunch of GIs that were just looked like they were just beat to death. They were all worn out and beat up and and we shuffle on through to go to our trucks to go to our compound, our uh, camp. And on the way there they had the back of one of these planes open and they were loading, I think there was 23 coffins that we watched them load that day. And that was our first realization that we were actually there. When you were first there, what, what was your job assignment? I was uh, infantry. In the Marine Corps, 
I don't know how it actually is with the others, but you have your primary MOS, which I was a truck driver in the States, and you have a secondary, which is a, a grunt infantry, and uh, during Tet, the Marines lost about five, 6,000 Marines just in 24, 48 hours, and we come in to replace those, so. Did you go right into combat? I mean, within a few months from your boot camp, we were into combat? We were, yes. I was with a unit that uh, we spent a lot of days out in uh, the bush, and we were out probably about eight days at a time, and we come into the Italian for one day off to clean up, you know, get drunk, forget about the guys that just got killed and the injuries, and then you go to sleep, wake up the next morning, and you're out gone uh, six or eight days again. So how about, um, were you ever, a, I have to ask this question, were you ever a prisoner of war or anything? No, no, no I wasn't. Uh, can you tell me about um, some of the most memorable experiences, some of the things that you remember the most from Vietnam? Uh, I would say the most memorable was would be uh, March 23rd. I stepped on a Chicom grenade, which is uh, about a 12-inch square box, and it's about 12 inches deep. And they anchor a grenade over here, and they run a trip wire across the center. Well, you step on that, and you lose your foot. And uh, when you're on patrol, like we were, in this area that was called Booby Trap Alley. Uh, there was, we always lost somebody going through there. Every day we went through, whether it was injury or killed or whatever. But as you walk and you step on a soft spot, you tell the GI behind you, so he walks around it. Then your uh, demolition man comes along and he digs that up. And then I went back and looked at it and, you know, and I just went, little ballistics because I didn't want to lose anything because uh, and then uh, we fanned out online because of that in case we stepped on one it wouldn't get the guy in front or behind you so we fanned out about 10 feet apart and then uh, my squad leader goes over and probably about Oh, maybe 10, 15 minutes later, he stepped on one. His foot went all the way through, but the wire was so rusty that it didn't go off. But, you know, hindsight, had I stepped on that the 23rd of March, I'd only lost a foot instead of both legs. And how long had you been in Vietnam by now? Uh, March was about three months. Okay. And then uh, May 13th is when I, I stepped on the big one that got me. So you've been out on, I guess, on patrol. Out on patrol. Out on patrol. Mm -hmm. and, um, Our so main objective was uh, guarding the the southern perimeter of uh, Da Nang, and that's an area called I Corps, and that's strictly Marines that work in there. So is that something that you would? It, I mean, it wasn't the first time you're doing this. This was. You've done it many times. Many, many times. And you always face this danger every time. Every time. Every time you now. Um, and I would, uh, I would think that it wasn't you that was affected. You said that you, every time you went out, you, you assumed somebody was going to be lost. Yes. Every time we went out, we lost somebody. How many? How many people were were in a unit? You were. 13 in a squad, one of those is being a corpsman, and you have your radio man and your squad leader, and you have three fire team leaders with four in each in each uh, team. And a lot of times when we went out on the big, on like the bigger ones, uh, all three squads of India Company, I was with India Company, uh, all three squads would go out. And sometimes we got relief by if somebody were to step on a landmine, uh, sometimes we'd go out with tanks. And then we were able to get on line behind the tanks and walk in their tracks. So if one did trip a landmine, why, it would, it would do the tank. So uh, 
we use a lot of precaution like that, but sometimes, you know, you're riding the tank and one day the, just depends on which tank you're on. The first squad was on the first tank, second on the second, and we were on the third, the third squad. And the second tank got hit by a rocket while everybody was on it, but we only lost one. His name was Corporal Wisdan. He was one of my, and that was one of the things that I, Corporal Wisdan was, uh, uh, I feel a little, real bad when I, when I say his name because him and I, the night before he got killed, we got in a fight, him and me. And uh, we were supposed to bury the sea ration cans and, and boxes. And because he outranked me by one rank, he was pulling it on me. And, and uh, I swung at him. And my uh, wristwatch got him across the face. And he had a scratch on there. And, and the day that he got hit, that his uh, tank got hit, he was the only one to get killed. And the concussion killed him. There was no blood, no nothing. But when I looked at him, the only mark he had on his face was from me the day before. But I figured we were teenagers and, you know, that kind of thing happens. But you, you talked before um, the medals or citations that you received while you were there? Yes. Was it was the Bronze Star and the Purple Heart. And what did you receive the Bronze Star for? For... Uh, capturing an enemy bunker. There was uh, a couple of us. Uh, we were getting sniper fire from a bunch of, from some VC up in front of us and couldn't figure out where it was coming from. So uh, uh, all graves went around one way, I went around the other way and it was just a matter of who got there first. And uh, threw a couple grenades in and and we, we got the gun and the bunker. And Can you describe that bunker for me? The, when I you say bunker, I have a vision of these World War II movies where they're all made of cement. No, they're not made of cement. They're made of uh, sandbags and and uh, anything they can get a hold of. A lot of them sometimes use the B-52 bombshell holes that we created. And they would put a little uh, cover over it. A lot of times we'd get sniper fire, they'd raise a They'd raise a lid up, fire off a magazine of uh, AK-47, drop the lid, and you could never see where they were at. You could never find them. But these guys we could spot pretty easy. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, um, about home. And like that. Okay. Were you able to talk, stay while you were in the service in Vietnam? Were you able to stay in touch with your family? No, no. just by letter. Just by letter. And sometimes those would get to us uh, three weeks late because we'd be out in the bush and you can't get your mail till you come in. They run it out to you every day or anything no. like that. Um, what was the food like over there? Eat from a can and a box. That's about all we had. That's all you had. Did you ever? Uh, I. You did spend all your time on patrol, but did you get to no. sample some of the never? No, nope. like never that? went to town. Our, our unit was too busy to go in and look for girlfriends and and run around. We, we just never got, we never got any time off. Now, three days after I got hit, uh, I was to go, we were supposed to have our first, our unit was supposed to have our first three-day R&R. But I got hit right before that was. Um, Over there? Yeah. Nothing? You heard somebody with a radio every now and then, but we just didn't have it. Because you didn't, you didn't have things that made noise when you're out in the bush because it gave up your, it would, it would give up your position. And you stayed as quiet and calm as you could the whole trip through there. The uh, moonlight was our, was one of our biggest enemies because they could see us silhouetted against the sky walking across the rice paddy dikes. So, and that was their, 
their biggest asset of, of uh, uh, ambushes and stuff. Uh, it was their biggest asset was the night because that's when they did most of their fighting against us. And the day, the day we well, the biggest thing we had was watching for booby traps. I got officially dis. I got hit May 13th, 1968. And I got officially discharged December 28th of the same year. When, when you were uh, hit, did, did they take you to a hospital or uh, well, in Vietnam? We were. It was on a Sunday, and uh, we were start on this operation called Allen Brook, and it was down on a hill called Hill 55. It was 18 miles south of Da Nang. We all loaded up, went up on the top of this hill. Uh, we started digging in, and uh, the the area we were in was occupied before. There's a unit called uh, 226 that was there before we were, and they left some sandbags laying. And there was uh, about a four or five hour lapse of time between when they left and when we got in, which allowed the VC time to come in and set booby traps. So there were bunkers and stuff there, but when you leave, you're supposed to slip the bags and, you know, dismantle the place. Well, we were up there and we started digging foxholes and we started hitting some rock. And the uh, commanding officer, the captain, said to start using those sandbags to build it up. So after about three or four trips, I told uh, uh, Steve Easton and Tom, I'll get his name later, but I, Tom Hansen, I told him them to stay back and I would carry him. So about four more trips, I lifted the uh, left sandbag up and then I went to lift the right one and I heard the pin and it uh, blew everything out on this side. My left leg went first and uh, I, I actually died for a little bit. I knew that I died, and and uh, these corpsmen come and they started pounding on my chest and got me back. And I raised up and I saw my my left leg gone and just it was actually cooking. But I you know I looked at the brighter side and I thought you know I've seen a few guys out there lose one, but I never seen them lose two. So uh, they. Uh, as they were still landing troops on the hill. And we had been there probably a couple hours. So they threw a green smoke flare down and the helicopter came right back down and uh, picked me up. And you have to realize in the 60s that the, uh, I hate, I, I like to put this in because of the, the attitude towards the black person. Uh, I was raised to not like them at all in the 60s was the way it was supposed to be. And I had a big grudge against a lot of black people as, as a lot of us, uh, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Northern people did. And that all changed because the very first person I saw, the corpsman that took care of me was black. His name was H.M. Uh, Price. And I've been trying to find him. I found a few buddies since then, but I've been trying to find him to say thanks. And from that day on, I've not had anything bad to say about any of them. But again, they threw me on the plane, and uh, uh, I was, I quit smoking. I started smoking basically in Indiana, but I quit there because of the, the glow. I didn't want to give her a position away with that. But on the helicopter, I asked the gunner, because I didn't want to go to sleep, because I was afraid I wouldn't wake up. I asked the gunner if he'd give me a cigarette. And he said, sure. And he bent down and he gave me one, and I had blood and dirt all over, and I couldn't see him. And, and I said, you're black, aren't you? He goes, yeah, why? I said, because this is a cool cigarette. And I said, you guys are the only ones that smoke these things. He goes, yeah, you're right. And he, he sat there, and he held that for me. And, uh, and I started feeling around and, and 
because I was going into shock. I knew I was going in and out. He was doing everything he could to keep me awake. And I felt this foot. And I said, well, who else got hurt? He said, well, there's about eight others got hurt, but you're the only one that's coming out now. I said, no, somebody's here because their foot's... He said, well, that's your foot. And I said, well, do you think they can put it back on? He said, no, sir, not that one. And I said, well, what's the point in taking it in? Just throw it away. And he goes, no, in case you die, we got to send all your parts back. And I, I made a yell like in the... Uh, the pilot heard me. I said, so the pilot makes a sharp left bank and it rolls out the door. And then I knew I was, I was going. I was lost a lot of blood and I was losing more. And, uh, and then he, he grabbed him. He grabbed my foot of my leg that was gone. And I thought he would throw it out the door beside me, but he pulled it across my chest, which I saw the leg and the flesh. And, the, and it's just a smell you'll never get rid of. And, and then I was about to go, and and he said, "Well, brother," he said, "that ought to, he said that ought to feed about a family of six, because that sucker is well cooked already." So that brought me back, and and we got into Da Nang, and they put me on this, uh, I call it a meat rack. You know, when you unload a semi, one of those ramps has got those rollers, where they put me on that, and it had hot steam on top and hot steam on the bottom, and then just cleaning me up and uh, put the mask on me and I went to sleep. That was about 11 o'clock in the morning and I didn't wake up till about oh, probably seven, six or seven that night. And I was wondering what took so long, but uh, I woke up and in the hospital they have these USO ladies, the volunteers that come in and my arms are, I got, shrapnel and, and uh, they're all bandaged and they're on board because I have uh, IV and blood in me and uh, and I couldn't move my right leg and I'm I'm asking her I, you know can I what's going on here and, and then she told me I lost that one too which I wasn't happy with because I didn't want to come home that way so I started acting like a fool and uh, she said, well, honey, before you start feeling sorry for yourself, I need you to look at the bed beside of you. And I looked over, and of course she helped me in because I couldn't move too well. And there was a white GI that was burned just like charcoal. He had no arms. He had no legs. He couldn't talk. He was blind. And they found a little vein in his, somewhere around his buttocks to get IV in him was just hanging on and uh, I was still wasn't real happy and then the uh, head doctor come in and found out saw what was going on they calmed me down a little bit and he said well Corporal Davis he said I'll tell it to you like this he said there was eight GI that came in while you were while you were uh, under and he said every time we get a head wound and a gut wound we got to move you aside because you're stabilized, you're going to make it. But these guys, when we get ahead and gut, we got to do them first. And he said it just took a long time because we had eight of them. We lost five, but if you want to take credit for the other three that made it, you know, you can take credit for it because you helped save those three guys' lives. And then from there, it, it turned around a little bit for me, and I wrote a she was writing a letter for me and I put in it to my mom because my mom went through, she was really taking a lot of us guys in Vietnam and especially losing my brother after Korea, taking it pretty bad. And I said, well, mom, at least this way I'll be able to walk straight because I was so bow-legged and pigeon-toed and I looked like I just got off a horse. So from there I brought it home and just everything was up. And I just refused even a day to let any of it get me down, so. And from, from there, did they transfer you back to the United States? They, I was in Guam. Guam. They flew me out that night, about midnight. Uh, they put me on a plane for Guam. Then about 1 or 1.30 in the morning, the, 
the hospital hooch that I was in, Kwanzaa that I was in, and the tube beside of it got hit by a rocket and everybody in it got killed. So I got lucky. I was in uh, I was in Guam for a month, and then they put me on this what I call a milk run, a bunch of us on this on the plane, and they take you to the nearest VA closest to your home. And I wanted to go to military VA, which uh, Philadelphia Naval Hospital because they said they'd give me the best treatment and they did and uh, I was uh, the last stop out of about 15 stops and they stopped, they landed in Walter Reed and they said you can go down by helicopter or by ambulance so we took there was three of us we took the ambulance but they rolled me out first time I'd seen daylight in five days being on my back and there's protesters there and uh, the one yelled out that's my brother that's my brother well I knew it wasn't my sisters and uh, so it wasn't talking to me so they let her through and she come running over there and she bent over and spit on me three times and called me a baby killing SOB and that was my welcome home my first time in the United States but I still didn't let it get me I went in and uh, got out of the hospital. The record for a double amputee to get out of there was 13 months, and I got out in five. Um, after you were discharged then, did you go back to school or were you interested in the GI Bill? Were you able to take advantage of that? No, I didn't. I was, at that, at that time, you could save your GI Bill money, your college money, and pass it on to your kids, or you could use it yourself. And I pass it on to my daughters and my both both my daughters graduated from college and I used it that way. Um, the friendships uh, while you were there, um, you talked about some of your friends, were you able to keep any of those up? I have found three since I've been out. The ones unfortunately that I can't find, we all gave each other nicknames. Mine was Mad Dog. We gave each other nicknames. So after you've been there a while, that's the only name you know them by. You never got to know them by their real name because you didn't want to. You didn't want to remember that. You, they could be there two days and dead the next, and you didn't allow yourself to get attached. You want to tell us how you got the name Mad Dog? No, mainly because of the bunker incident. Yeah. Is there anything else that you'd like to get on the record? Nothing other than, uh, you know, I was proud to do it. I've done what I did. I don't know if I would have uh, interested in going, uh, you know, to Iraq and doing what's going on now, but I figure, you know, it needs to be done. So all we can do is support the GIs. Um, and I do know, um, I have been told that you were involved in. Um, I'm not even sure what it's called, but uh, wheelchair. Wheelchair games, yeah. yeah. I've been doing those for about oh, 17 of the last 22 years. And I set the world record in uh, 100 meter in track. I still have the shot put record and I still have the weight bench press record. So I compete. I've been to like 11 different countries overseas. Mostly promoting the sport, promoting wheelchair sports. And what kind of work did you actually did you go into after? Um, I was after I worked at a little here in South, South Whitley at a tool and die place. Then I moved to California where I lived for about 20 years. I had a embroidery shop, clothing, and then after that I got involved with uh, uh, youth. Uh, at a correctional facility. These were kids from 14 to 18 that were locked up for rape, murder, robbery, and I was the uh, recreation coordinator at, at the prison for those guys for a number of years. 